Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Stef, and I do some stuff, and this is one of those stuff that I do. And I'm super excited about this stuff, so uh, I, you have to um, enjoy me for the next couple of minutes uh, while I try to get my excitement over to you. Um, what I'm super excited about uh, is uh, how to store your password securely and also um, how to authenticate towards servers uh, without all those plaguing uh, problems that hashed passwords uh, have today in the world where we still might be using MD5 hash passwords without sorts. But it's getting rarer and rarer, of course. So um, first, a little detour. Um, there's this really, really awesome um, guidelines from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, the standard is, or the guideline is 863.3. And it provides, it is from last year, and, uh, and it provides uh, implementers with guidelines of how to handle passwords. And uh, it prescribes that the password should have like a minimum length and there should be no upper maximum to a password. But if you really have to do that, there's no reason to do, then you should accept at least 64 character long passwords. So if you see a website that uh, says you cannot have a password longer than like 12 uh, characters, then it's definitely not uh, according to these guidelines. Uh, and furthermore, uh, this guideline also prescribes that password should be any character. There should be like, you know, those uh, SQL injection and stuff like this. Uh, forbid some characters, that should not be the case at all. You should allow all characters, even Unicode characters, even the poop emoji should, can be part of your password and might be. Um, furthermore, uh, the standard or the guidelines also uh, prescribes that there should be no composition rules in passwords. You know, the composition rules, it has to contain two capital letters, two lowercase letters, and so on and so on. It should be, if you use a big, strong enough password, then these uh, rules, these composition rules make no sense, uh, unnecessary. So why is this important? We have offline dictionary attacks when the uh, WordPress is being attacked. Then you see all those uh, passwords in the database dump. Uh, which are hashed with some kind of hashing algorithm, depending on how old the WordPress site is. There might be some, some really old hashing thing being used, or maybe something better like bcrypt or pbkdf. Uh, but anyway, if you consider that today, in the world of today, we have uh, blockchain miners that are tuned to hash stuff as quickly as possible so that the miner is as uh, profitable as possible. That still means that if you run a dictionary attack uh, on the passwords that are leaked, you still can check a couple of millions per seconds with, uh, with recent mining gear that has been obsolete and is not profitable for mining anymore, but it still might be super profitable for mining passwords of people using WordPress. Um, so offline dictionary attacks is really a, a bad thing, and uh, it comes from uh, the attacker simply iterating through the, the words in the dictionary and trying to hash those and then seeing what, which hashes match with those from the dumped database. So there's a solution for this. You can use password managers, uh, and password managers come with a couple of benefits. If they enforce those benefits, not all password managers do. Um, and one of them is that you should not, or the password stored in the password manager will not be reused, which is not true because it might happen that your password manager imports your old passwords, and before that you have not been using a password manager, which means your password password is imported in all your accounts, and then the password manager stores the password password, and you haven't gained anything. Uh, the other thing that uh, comes with password managers, but still is not enforced, that it doesn't We saw your tail. Okay. Um, so you should not use dictionary words, of course, and uh, password managers allow you to generate completely random passwords because you don't have to remember them, you don't have to type them. So those passwords can be quite high entropy and quite long. And uh, 
well, and this is the last point that is the most important, that when you use passwords, the password should actually have high entropy. Because the, the high entropy gar guarantees you that even if there's a, a brute force attack against your password, it will be computationally super difficult and take a long time to, to brute force your password uh, when trying all the combinations. And uh, the thing is to have a, a password that is like, I read 50 bits, but uh, I'm more advocating again uh, towards 80 bits of entropy. Um, and uh, 80 bits of entropy are passwords that are about um, 20 characters long, uh, but it depends on what kind of characters you use in there. Um, so we have two kinds of password managers. We have on one side, we have online password managers, which allow easy synchronization between all kinds of devices. People want to use their passwords on mobile phones, on their laptops, on their PCs. And if you store all your passwords in the cloud, then there's no need to synchronize your passwords because they're all stored there. And from all your devices, you access them uh, on the cloud. Uh, and there's usually also very little installation overhead. You just uh, might be even just using the, the password manager in a browser. Uh, the, uh, the cons to this is, of course, privacy, because the online password manager can, can track which, uh, where do you log in and how often you log in. Uh, and of course, it also increases the attack surface, because from now on, not only your computer is a nice target, but there's a much juicier target that is the password, uh, the, the cloud password storage itself. If anyone can get their hands on that, that means uh, a bonanza of uh, passwords that might be attacked brute force or maybe even dictionary attacked, um, depending on how the password storage, the cloud-based password storage actually operates and generates the passwords. And um, I think from my perspective, uh, from a security conscious and competent person's perspective, this is a, a classical trade-off where you trade convenience for security, and you have less security but more convenience. On the other hand, you also have offline password managers. We all know them like uh, one of the favorite and famous ones is Keeper 6. Uh, you have control over that. Uh, you can be sure that there's no um, JavaScript injected or changed that is sent to you by the, the cloud provider because you have like installed it and uh, there's uh, signatures on that and uh, it's also verifiable. You can check that uh, uh, the code is actually compiling to, to what you're running. But uh, the cons are synchronization of the passwords among devices. Uh, that makes it kind of a hassle. And uh, and the, really, the user is responsible for security. So maybe it's not a good idea for my mom to use this kind of uh, password manager. But maybe me, I am paranoid enough and uh, competent enough to actually secure the password manager uh, for uh, my use. And in this case, if uh, then it's a security over convenience trade-off. I have less convenience, but uh, more security probably. So, and there's a few cons of all password managers. Uh, you have a master password, and usually with most uh, password managers, you only have one master password. So if that master password leaks or can be brute forced, then you are as fucked as previously, or even worse. Um, then, of course, if your database leaks, it can be also brute forced. Uh, uh, your, your master password can be brute forced against the, the the, pass, the, the database, and uh, with password managers, there's one problem that is always uh, there, that is key logging. So if there's some malware on your computer where you type in your password, your master password, your master password is immediately compromised because someone just logged that and uh, can use that to get access to your other passwords. And the other, the last thing is the, what I already referred to, that is many password managers that actually keep the old user chosen passwords, which are inherently weak, and then you have no benefit in using a password manager. So, and of course, uh, password managers introduce uh, a second attack surface, which might be quite huge. Uh, so the server database and uh, your local storage is, uh, so the, the server user database is what I mean is like the WordPress where you log in. There's one attack surface where you can attack for passwords, and now there's a second attack surface with a, with a password manager where the password is stored. So this is also uh, something to consider as a drawback to password managers. So, but then we have not talked about crypto so far, really. There is magic silver bullets. 
uh, unicorns and stuff sometimes. And uh, this is uh, the, the Sphinx protocol that I'm going to uh, introduce to you um, now. Um, and I'm really excited about this protocol. Uh, don't be too um, intimidated by this, but this is from the paper. I know it's not readable. This is just an example to show you how big the whole protocol is. This is the complete protocol. It fits on half of a page. I'm going to show you the, all the details later on. You don't have to try to read it. I'm going to step by step and explain what is happening here. Uh, but what I want to show you that this is really a simple protocol. Uh, this is there's there's really not much happening here, but uh, the magic behind it uh, makes it informationally uh, secure. That means that you can only do a full brute force attack against anything, and even that under just uh, a few selected uh, conditions. Um, so the benefits of Sphinx is uh, the name is the store that perfectly hides itself, uh, hides from itself, no exaggeration. Um, that is the uh, abbreviation that Sphinx uh, abbreviates to. Uh, it is an information theoretically uh, secure password store, which means that there's no other way than to really do a full brute force attack against uh, the storage. Uh, the password manager itself does not know neither your master passwords nor any of your passwords. Um, and the only information that the password manager stores is completely independent from your master password and from the password that is generated from it. And uh, the last and very uh, I think important benefit is that unlike with other password storages, here you can have more master passwords uh, for different uh, passwords. So how does this work? Um, okay, maybe I go step back. Uh, first of all, I'm just showing you how you use the Sphinx password storage to retrieve a password that has been stored already in the storage. But um, I have not explained how you get that in the initialization, how you create a, a new user that is being stored. That is uh, very simple. Uh, it's basically the same steps as we, as we do here uh, in the login phase. The only thing is that when you create a new user in the password store, the password store generates a 32-byte random byte sequence and stores that for this particular user and this particular site where you're going to log in. And this is completely independently generated from anything of your input or anything. Um, and uh, that's about it. Uh, that is what is happening. And uh, it, it is the only thing uh, that this is generated in the registration phase. The rest is basically the same as in the login phase. And I'm going to show you the login phase. In the login phase, you type in your password on your laptop where you like want to log in to your favorite WordPress site. And uh, you type, uh, you get a, a pop-up window and you have to type in your master password to unlock the, the password manager, right? Uh, in the second step, the password manager generates, uh, here I call it the user, generates a random value R, which is 32 bytes of uh, uh, a 32 byte random high entropy sequence, and uh, and then comes really the magic. Uh, the, the password manager takes the password that you entered in the first step and hashes that value to a point on an elliptic curve. This is this H uh, inside the PVD. And then on this elliptic curves, it raises this point to the power of R, which is a completely random 32-byte sequence. What happens here, that you you basically, this is the blinding step. You blind the hash of your password with a random blinding factor R. And this is every time you do this, the blinding factor is something different. So every time you log in, something else falls out of this uh, third step. Um, in the next phase, you send this A value that I show, that we calculated in step Three, you send this A value to the password storage. The password storage can be anything. It can be your phone, or it can be an online service, or it can be a dedicated hardware device. Um, the storage, it might be your phone again, or, or an online service. It uh, takes this random 32-byte 
so-called salt that it generated when you registered your user for this website and raises this A value from step three to this K that was generated when you created the account in the password store. That's it. So basically what you have now, B is really the password hashed uh, multiplied by the random blinding factor R, and this is again multiplied by the sort that is stored by the uh, password storage K. That is really what this B is. You just follow these steps backwards. This is very simple, basic uh, um, elementary school algebra most of the time. So, and then the storage sends back this B value. And what happens when the, uh, the, the user receives it? It actually unblinds this whole value. It takes B to the one under R uh, multiplication, which uh, basically removes the very first step. First you multiply something by R, and then you divide it by R. That means you basically did not nothing. So in the end, what you get out of this operation is really the value of your password hashed to the power of K. K has been contributed by the storage, and uh, the password has been contributed by you. This is the output of the Sphinx protocol, and this is a 32-byte long string that is completely random and always the same for the same site and for the same user. Uh, and this is a high entropy password. This is 32 bytes, 8-bit um, entropy, basically. You can derive this into something that is printable characters or ASCII characters or anything. There's simple ways to actually generate, if, if a website doesn't accept completely binary passwords, then you can derive longer uh, ASCII or, or Unicode passwords from this. Oh, but that is, uh, I think, out of the scope of this talk. So basically, this is, this is what's happening uh, with the Sphinx protocol. This is all. Um, Talking about the security, what happens in this uh, in this password uh, protocol? If the password storage gets compromised, that is absolutely no problem because the password storage, the only thing it contains is a bunch of 32-byte random strings. They have nothing to do with anything. There's no sensitive uh, information stored in that. That's why it's really called a salt. It's not a password. It's not a nothing else. It's really a salt. Uh, the network might be compromised, so anyone listening for your communication between you, your password, or when you en enter your password, and the storage, it might be owned by, by any adversary. And it doesn't matter, because the blinding basically encrypts your, your, the hash of your password. And, and an ad adversary will not be able to deduce any uh, information about your password. So that means that anything outside of your uh, laptop where you enter the password can be compromised by an adversary. Even the password storage can be operated, for example, by the NSA. And still, this protocol should make it safe that even if you store your password with the NSA, the only thing they will know that you logged into some site, uh, but nothing else, but not even which site. Um, so, uh, this is super good. The other thing that uh, it protects against is if there's a, the, a server, there cannot be any dictionary attack run on the, like the MySQL, uh, the, the WordPress site where you want to log in. There, there cannot be any dictionary attack ag run against you because your password is not based on words that are in a password store or uh, in a dictionary because it's completely random, right? Um, uh, the only problem that is possible when both the storage, like the user database of WordPress and the storage, uh, the password storage, both get compromised, then it's possible to run an offline dictionary attack against your master password if you use a, 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 a dictionary-based password. And uh, the, the same, this, this, this protocol doesn't protect you against um, keylogging. When you are when your host where you type your password is compromised by some kind of malware, so, but this is super nice and uh, the whole thing is implemented. So I implemented the uh, the Sphinx protocol in a library. This is a C library, uh, which basically only implements uh, the the protocol itself, lib Sphinx. Then I have some Python bindings for uh, the Sphinx uh, C library. 
which not only come with uh, Python bindings, but it comes also with a simple server and client. So you can immediately run Sphinx as your personal password store by running the, the server somewhere on one of your hosts. And uh, the client can run locally. This is a common line based uh, solution. And then I have two. Uh, Web applications, uh, web extensions actually, uh, for Chrome-based uh, browsers, so even Opera should be supported, and uh, for Firefox. Um, the thing is, from, for Firefox, you can download the uh, Web Sphinx from the Mozilla add-on store, but for um, the Chrome-based ones, um, Google actually wants developers who publish their extensions to first um, leak some of their private data by requiring them to pay five US dollars to Google. And uh, I tried to pay them five US dollars by buying an anonymous credit card and uh, paying them with this anonymous credit card, but they rejected this on the grounds that this is an anonymous credit card and they really want to allow my, my financial data. So, um, and that's the reason why I, in the end, I did not uh, register with Chrome or with the Chrome store. So for Chrome, you have to go to, to GitHub to install this extension. Uh, for Windows users, I, I created a, an installer, so you can actually just click on, on WinSphinx and uh, there's an exe and it installs all the dependencies and everything on, on Windows and then you should be able to, to uh, get it running. There's also some talks, maybe it gets packaged into Debian, but it's not that far yet. And then we have uh, the fine contribution of DNet who has been doing, I think uh, last time I checked, it was 10 commits into the repo, which is quite a, quite something already. Uh, so for Android, there might be, if you pass the DNet enough, then there might be some support for, for Android, uh, and then you can use uh, the Sphinx protocol also for storing your passwords on your phone. And I have also a friend of mine, Dr. Vox, who, who tried to get this started on iOS, on, on Apple phones. But uh, I'm not very convinced that he gotten very far. So if anyone wants to contribute, an iOS uh, port is very much welcome. And then if anyone remembers my talks from the previous years, I was talking about a hardware device that I called a Pitchfork. And the Pitchfork is actually supporting the Sphinx protocol. And you can use uh, store your password in, uh, in the Pitchfork. So anyone who wants to test this or port it to other smartphone devices and users, anyone is super welcome with LipSphinx. And um, this brings me to the second part of the talk. Uh, it's not only about uh, how passwords should look, but there's also how servers should handle logins and passwords. And uh, going back to this National Institute of Standards uh, 863 three digital authentication guidelines, on the server side, uh, there's also some recommendations. For example, there should be no expiration of passwords whatsoever. Not the, the rule that you should uh, refresh your passwords every month or something is, uh, is really stupid, and you shouldn't do that. And even this guideline says so. Uh, and then it also uh, requires or recommends all passwords to be hashed. Uh, they should be also sorted. And uh, they should also be stretched. And uh, the sorting is that you have always some kind of uh, maybe known random uh, byte sequence, and the stretching means that you do not hash it once, but you hash it a couple thousand or 10,000 times. Uh, furthermore, it also re uh, recommends to know how don't have password hints, like the password starts with uh, letter A, or the password is related to your dog's name, or something like that. Uh, and this is also the knowledge-based uh, authentication, like what is your mother's maiden name uh, and stuff like this. And it also, I'm super glad that they do that. They also say that uh, SMS is not a two-factor authentication. And I think this is super important. Uh, I don't know if you know that, but if you see two-factor authentication and they say it's SMS, then it's not. Run away, yes. <laughs> And also run away. But uh, there's one thing that I miss in these guidelines is actually that uh, copy pasting of passwords should uh, be allowed. 
and that is not in this guideline. And we see a lot of uh, sites that disallow copy pasting of passwords, which basically makes the the usage of password managers more difficult. Luckily, the Lips Sphinx or the, the the Web Sphinx implementation that I use is not based on copy pasting, but it actually sends key press events to the form. So even if copy pasting is disallowed with my uh, extensions, it should still work. So and uh, here I would come to the the second very exciting uh, crypto protocol, and this is about how you can handle authentication on a server uh, in a proper way, uh, in a way that is similar to the Sphinx protocol, has some very strong security guarantees that you don't have uh, with the classical mechanisms. And uh, this is the OPAC protocol, and again, you can see the whole protocol is really simple. That's basically all the protocol is, and it's even a bit less than uh, than the Sphinx protocol. And uh, it is really the Sphinx protocol applied to the server side. You will see uh, huge uh, uh, similarities to the Sphinx protocol, and I'm going to go through the initialization phase here as well, and also the login phase, uh, what happens. And you have to imagine, you can combine these two things. On one side, me as a user, I'm using the Sphinx protocol. I'm getting my passwords from there. I have a high entropy password. And then when I have this high entropy password, I put it into this OPAC protocol and use OPAC and my high entropy password to log in to maybe Drupal or something. Um, so the initialization phase can be done in two different ways. Uh, one is the, the, the uh, where everything is done by the server, really. Uh, there's one problem with that in that in, during the initialization phase, the server actually sees your high entropy password. Uh, but this is sometimes useful if the server wants to enforce some certain password rules. Like there is a rule, for example, to not have a password that is in the top thousand list of used passwords or leaked passwords, right? So you want to check that the password is not password. You'd want to check that the password is not all these other passwords that are very common. And that makes actually sense. Uh, but this is mostly useful, I think, in centralized organizations. But uh, in other cases, you might not want the server to actually know your high entropy password, and that is also possible. But in this case, the initialization phase is a, is a four-step procedure, while if you trust the server and give them your password once, then it's basically uh, a two-step procedure. And what happens here in, this, uh, in the initialization phase is that, uh, of course, the server has to generate and publish a uh, a public uh, private key pair, of course only the public key gets published, the private key it keeps to itself, and for each user it generates a random sort K, and this is exactly what was happening in the Sphinx protocol when you enlisted a new user for, for your password store, then the password store was uh, generating a random sort K, and here in this case the server where you're going to log in generates a random sort K for you. And then, depending if you want the high privacy or the the the, uh, the other procedure where the server can check your password, um, someone generates the uh, public key pair for the user. So the user also needs a public private key pair. And then, in this step, uh, the user also generates this capital K value, which is based on the user's high entropy password, it might come out of a, a Sphinx session, and uh, then the password is also hashed with this sort K that has been generated in this step, and this is the, the capital K value. And how, how this step, this H, this password hashed, and then multiplied by K, is exactly the same where you can if you if you want to hide this from the server, you calculate the the password, hash it, uh, and then you blind it with a random R. You send this to the server. The server multiplies its K into it. It sends it back to you, and then you divide by R again the random blinding value. And in the end, you get this. Uh, password hashed by K without revealing to the server your password ever. Um, and then you have this capital K value, and using this capital K value, you encrypt uh, your public private key pair that you just generated in this step, uh, and you 
uh, also encrypt uh, the server's public key. Encrypted keys you give to the server, and the server stores that for you. And in theory, the server should not be, uh, depending on if you, in, during the initialization phase, you actually disclose your password or not, the, the, the server should not be able to ever decrypt any of the, the keys that you encrypted in this case. Uh, and this is the initialization phase. So what happens here, you basically use the Sphinx protocol to store some encrypted public-private key pairs on the server. This is the initialization phase. So there's no password that is being stored at the, uh, at the server. There's um, only uh, secret keys. And this is also an interesting uh, uh, thing that you can expand on later on. So, and if you, if you want to log in to this Drupal site that is super highly secure with passwords, you first of all generate an ephemeral key pair. And again, this blinding factor R, which we already know from the Sphinx protocol. And this is, exact, is, is actually what was happening in the Sphinx protocol. You hash your password, you blind it, and you get this A value, and you send over the A value and the ephemeral key pairs public part over to the server. So in, in, if you remember the Sphinx protocol, it was almost the same, except there was no ephemeral key pair. Here you get also an ephemeral key pair. So then the server, what does the server do? The server also generates an ephemeral key pair, so it provides uh, some kind of uh, forward secrecy. Uh, then the server calculates this B value, which is basically your hashed password that is blinded, and uh, multiplies it by K. And this K is this sort that has been generated by the server uh, when you initialize, initialize your user there. Um, and then uh, the server already has all the information to generate a, or calculate a shared secret S using the server's long-term key and the ephemeral key that you just sent over and that the, uh, the ephemeral key that the server also generated. Um, and after this, you have this uh, shared secret S and with this shared secret S, the server calculates an authentication token which is basically H making the value 1 and for the secret, the uh, this shared secret S is being used. And then the server answers to the user. It sends this B value, which is the blinded password uh, multiplied by the sort stored by the, K, uh, the server. It sends the authentication value, which is this token. And it sends over the encrypted keys that the user stored during the encryption, uh, the initialization phase. And of course, it sends also its own ephemeral key that has just been generated. And then, we almost there, uh, the user calculates its own K that was used for encrypting the keys by unblinding the B value, which is, as you can see, is here. Where you first blinded it with R, and then you remove the R blinding factor, so basically you get back uh, the password hashed and then multiplied by the uh, salt K that was stored on the server. And using that and the password, hash, hash of the password, it is able to decrypt the public private key pair that it generated at the beginning of the initialization phase. And uh, so it has its own long term keys, and using the, his own long term keys and the uh, ephemeral keys that have been generated in, in this step here, when he initiated the session. Um, you can the, the the user can generate uh, calculate the same shared secret that the server was calculating here. This is basically a Diffie-Hellman uh, kind of uh, key uh, exchange, an authenticated key exchange, and then using this S value, the client can actually calculate the same auth token by just hey, h making the value one with the shared secret, and if this out token that the client calculated is the same that the server sent, then the client can be sure that the server is indeed the server and there's no man in the middle, there's no uh, impersonation attack uh, happening here. And uh, if the user also wants to authenticate explicitly uh, to the server, then the user uh, hmax the value 2 with the secret S, and sends that back explicitly to the server. But this is only needed if you really use this protocol for only authentication. If you don't only, if you also use this, the shared secret that got derived in this session for also encryption, 
then you can go on and just send your data over to the server, and the server will only be able to decrypt the data that you send when the S value is the same on both sides. So this is a kind of implicit uh, authentication with a, uh, where, you, where the encryption itself serves as the authentication authentication mechanism and this is super nice so this is also something that that you would love to have in for example TLS uh, or, or similar sessions um, the benefits of, 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 of opaque are that uh, due to the use of ephemeral keys uh, the whole uh, protocol is forward secure there's no way to actually do pre computation like you can with uh, um, MD5 hashed passwords, I can just go and calculate, uh, take a dictionary and calculate each word of a dictionary and hash it with MD5 and then I have a, a list of MD5 hashes and the value that it hashes through. And uh, when I get a leaked database, I just look uh, what hashes I have in my database and I don't need to do any calculation. This is a pre-computation and this you cannot do with OPAC at all. Um, the other nice thing is that you can do the stretching, that means like the hashing multiple times of the password is not happening on the server at all. So that means the DOS attacking the server by making it do lots of expensive computations is not happening because it, the, the stretching happens on the, on the client. Um, uh, again, I, uh, I talked about the salt. The user never needs to know the salt, and the server never needs to know actually the password. So the salt always stays on the on the server. And the password, if you use the the more secretive uh, variant of this protocol, then the password never leaves the client and never hits the the server. And then, of course, what I already referred to is the whole thing is an ACR. This is an authenticated key exchange. So at the end of this whole session, you have a shared secret that you can use for do all kinds of crypto operations, signing, macking, uh, encrypting, et cetera, decrypting, of course. Uh, if you, the, the only con is that if you want to have an explicit authentication, then there is one extra message at the end of the protocol. So you have three messages that need to be exchanged. Uh, and you have uh, mutual authentication of the server and the client. So OPAC is also implemented uh, in C, in the LibSphinx uh, library, um, but there's really no, no support in any server, so there's no, it is planned to, to support PAM, Nginx authentication modules, JavaScript, PHP, anything. Uh, if you want to contribute uh, support for this on like Drupal, WordPress or the, the usual targets, uh, it would be super nice to implement. But then uh, you also need to implement the OPAC protocol as probably as a web extension for the browser because the browser also doesn't speak to the web extension. So there's still some work to be done to actually support this on the web. But on lower levels, on maybe PAM, it is uh, much easier to already support um, the OPAC protocol for authentication and setting up cryptographic context. Uh, another thing that I didn't mention, when you initiate the whole thing, you, you store uh, a public-private key pair on the server, and the server has no access to that. And there's other things that you can store. You can store your name, you can store other private data, because it's just an encrypted blob that the server stores. And you the server will never have access to that. So. Uh, you can store your Bitcoin wallet uh, 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 credentials or anything else. There's, there's a lot of other stuff that you can actually store in this protocol and the server provides you back with this information when you need it. The nice thing is you don't need to store anything. The only thing, the server stores everything. The only thing you need to know is your own uh, high entropy password from which to derive and decrypt all the stuff that the server sends back to you. Uh, so this is really on on the client side. This is a kind of stateless thing, and all the store uh, state is stored on on the server. And this is also a really nice um, um, attribute of this protocol. And uh, this is my final slide, I think. Shocked faces. <laughs> Please.
your, your Sphinx protocol um, assumes that uh, you generate a fixed password based on, on, on the head and the soul. And, um, but this, this password you're generating has certain properties, it's a certain length uh, or some random length. And what if, if the password, uh, the, the server requires you to have a certain password structure, like only 20 characters, only special characters, and so on? How do you handle this in, this in this protocol? So the question was that uh, the Sphinx protocol generates a certain kind of password. And the uh, servers might have different rules uh, accepting passwords. Uh, I, I refer to this that in the uh, this, the Sphinx protocol itself, the output of it is a 32-byte completely random byte sequence. And uh, the way there's many ways to generate uh, out of this something uh, deterministically that is accepted by servers with stupid rules. Um, and uh, one way to do this is to um, take this 32-byte uh, value and divide it by the number of characters that are allowed by the server. For example, the server allows only capital letters, uh, lowercase letters, numbers then that means it's uh, 62 characters. So you have the 32-byte big number, and you divide it by 62. You take the reminder, that is the v one character. And uh, the, the result is what you are going to divide again and again, and then you always take the reminder, and then you extend uh, this ASCII password by the reminders, and then you divide it as long as necessary, as long as you hit the maximum length of the password accepted by the server. So this is a way to do it, for example. But in this case, you need to store for each server what kind of password is accepting, like what is the maximum length, and you need to store also what is the uh, what character classes are allowed by the server. Yes. Uh, the Sphinx uh, Python uh, wrapper implements this actually. That question in a different way, or can someone interpret this for me? So the, the question was uh, that you have a man in the middle attacker. When you do the send over the blinded hash of your password to the storage, and uh, and then the man in the middle is doing a timing attack on on the amount of hashes. There's no hashing happening after the blinding. Uh, yeah. No, no, no. You don't hash R times. No, no, no. You hash once, or you you do stretching, if you want to do that. So that is always ten thousand times hashing the same password, and then this uh, this is um, if you do RSA style, then is this is really the exponentiation. If you do uh, elliptic curves, then this is really a scalar multiplication uh, operation. So you really have a uh, the output of the hash, probably 32 bytes again, and then the 32 byte thing is a, a point on an elliptic curve, and then this elliptic curve point gets multiplied by the value r, and you get another elliptic curve point, and the elliptic curve that I'm using in the Sphinx protocol is uh, the decaf implementation of the curve 25519, uh, which is very common, and uh, this uh, curve 2519 is optimized to not have any kind of uh, timing attacks against it. So a man in the middle will have no no way to to deduce R or the hash password. Zoltan? If I understood correctly, you need a server for the Sphinx protocol. Yes? 
is you, there public service? The I is operate. It a okay. Single point of failure. So okay. So the question is, you need a server for the Sphinx protocol, and uh, is there servers available, and is this a single point of failure? Um, yes, yes, yes. Uh, so first of all, uh, you need a server, but the server can be your phone. So you decide where you store this. There's no phone-based uh, storage implementation yet. The Python version actually implements a, a simple async EO-based server, which you can run anywhere on the internet. And then you can store your passwords there. The whole idea is to have a separated storage from where you enter your password. So uh, this gets separated, and this is this is actually a security benefit that uh, the storage is not uh, and is completely independent from where you are. Uh, it, it makes no sense to have the storage on your on your laptop. Um, and uh, it is a kind of single point of fa uh, failure indeed. But on the other hand, you could actually publish the whole database of salts because there's no there's no value in that. But of course, on the other hand, uh, it makes the attackers uh, 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 attack more efficient if the attacker has also access to a user database of a Drupal or something. Then it can run. Uh, an, a brute force attack or maybe even a dictionary attack against your password storage. But backuping should be possible, even if you're not public, publishing the, the password storage. It, the, the single point of failure aspect can be mitigated by actually backing up the password storage. It's only a bunch of salts. It's really not secrets. Thanks, but you, you do not need a personal server, so a group of people can have a uh, public server as well. Huh? Yes, you can run as many servers as you want. You can run your own server. There's no. This is a. This is all comes with the Python implementation of the wrapper. You can run your your own server immediately, and you can host it for your hackerspace, for your own community, your family and then you are in charge in your family for all the passwords and still your family doesn't have to trust you if you if they can verify that you are indeed running the sphinx protocol and not just uh, storing everything in plain text is that okay yes uh, I, 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 with the, with the limitation that the, then I, as a, as a server owner, can brute force that password as well? No, you cannot. You cannot brute force the passwords of your family. Uh, okay, I, I cannot brute force, uh, but, but I, the only I thing sti still have some uh, no. advantage uh, against other attackers, not? Because oh. I have the... The only advantage is if you if you t assuming that you are hosting your family's password storage and your family's WordPress, in that case you have an opportunity to brute force their master passwords. But if you're not hosting the WordPresses or not hosting any of uh, uh, servers where the passwords are being used from your storage, then the the family should be pretty safe. Try to brute force an online WordPress server. Uh, listen, with, with, with when 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 your family member, your mom, logs in, she this is what you get from her. You get 32 bytes that are completely random, and this is the hash of your mom's password. It might be password, but you you don't know the R. The R is not shown. You you are you you don't know what the R is. So, f getting this information, you as a storage, as the password storage, does not help you at all because of the blinding, the R here. So this does not allow you to brute force anything of your of your mom's password, uh, and uh, this is what is being returned also doesn't help you really. In the end, this is the value that is computed, and you have contributed the K to it, but you have no clue about this part, about the hash of the password. And you also have no clue about this, this final value 
of the hash password uh, multiplied or uh, exponentiated by k. Is this okay? But, but I can, can try to reinforce the password then and send it to the WordPress and see if, if it accepts Which, which step do you brute force? The, the password in, in the step uh, six. Not. How do, what do you do in the brute force attempt? I, I try a different password. I have the key and okay. uh, make, make the hash make the operation with the key and uh, send it to the WordPress oh, yeah. like that. that you can do, yeah. And if it uh, allows me, then I know the password. No? That is true, yeah. So I still have some possibility to put for the Yeah, but this password. whole setup is against offline attacks, not online attacks. Yeah, okay, indeed. of course, yes. Thanks. Uh, you had a question? Um, could you go back to the initial initialization phase of uh, OPAC? Yeah. Uh, because I've got a question there. Um, so the public key of the server is uh, used uh, to, to calculate the, the value less than later stored in the server, right? Sorry? Uh, the public key of the server is used in the calculation for the value... Um, in the initialization it is not used, it's only for the shared secret used. All right. Here in the initialization phase you only generate the keys, the long-term keys, but the long-term keys are not used for anything. So in this case, in the, during the initialization, the server has a long-term key pair, and the client has a long-term key pair. Both get generated in this phase, but they are not contributing to any kind of uh, uh, cryptographic uh, procedure in, in the initialization phase. What uh, I wanted to know was basically, um, so in the, in the penultimate bullet, you say that uh, uh, the user encrypts the user key pair, key, key pair and the server public key pair with K, and that value is then stored on the server. Yes. Right. Um, so, if for whatever reason the public key of the server ever needs to change, then all the passwords are yeah. no longer. Uh, that is true. That is true. All right. That's what I wanted to know. Yeah. So, the question was. Uh, when any of the long-term key pairs uh, need to be uh, refreshed, then this whole system has to be rerun because you need to redo the whole initialization phase. Um, that is indeed the case, yes. You had a question? Uh, well, what about the synchronization of these attributes that are tied to these identities, like how many characters and what character set can be used for that account. Has there been any improvement on that front? I think we did something, but I don't remember what the implementation does. Um, let's see what the implementation does. It seems that we are encrypting it with with the password or something derived from the password. No, I I'm sorry. I have to I have to look that up again. But it's implemented already. So the 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 rules are now stored on the password, 
uh, on the storage, which is a which is a thing that is important because otherwise, if these rules like how long is the password maximum and uh, what character classes are allowed, if you store that on the client, then you have a synchronization problem again, and uh, you want to store that on the server. So this is why the question is relevant. You want to see a demo? It's really not very exciting, but uh, so um, in this case, I'm. Can you see this? So in this case, my master password is the well chosen high entropy password RSDF, and uh, I'm actually uh, and uh, I'm running Sphinx. Uh, this is the the command line client implemented in Python. I create a new user. The user is Steph. The site where I'm going to log in with this user is control c dot hu, and. Uh, the character classes that are allowed is uppercase, lowercase, symbols, and digits. And there's no upper limit for the password. Ah, ah I need to run a server, actually. This is a good reminder to start that server. <laughs> the, the server is uh, opt aptly called Oracle. And uh, it's nice because now it's in the verbose de debug mode. And it's uh, it's very verbose, so it says what uh, what is happening. The server is running in verbose mode, as you can see. It's listening on on this IP address, localhost, on this port, and it stores all the data uh, in a directory that is under this directory. It's called data. Um, some other entries in the config file are for the web sphinx and for the client, um, which I'm going to show you. Cut. So this is really the config file that I'm using. The client has almost the same configuration as the server. That's it. So now I'm going to create this password again. Uh-huh. Oh, the user already exists. OK, let's um, kill, kill the password storage. <laughs> OK, now it should work. Exactly. So oh, yeah, this is now verbose. But uh, so this is the data that uh, the client sends over to the server. This is the data that the client receives from the server. Unfortunately, still double quoted for some stupid reason. Stupid Python tree. <laughs> and uh, and this is the password that has been derived and is uh, is consisting only of the upper lower symbols and digit uh, characters. And since it has no upper limit in the, in size, this is the maximum size that has been generated from the password that has been. Um, Stored uh, with Sphinx, and on the on the other side, this is the server. What the server saw first, the server is of course serving, and then suddenly there's a connection coming in from somewhere, and then it receives this data. This is basically the blinded password ISDF, and then the server sends back this blinded password ISDF um, multiplied by the sort that is stored, and so that's the thing. So this is now I have a, a password stored in the uh, in the password storage for this user. Now I can also do the get operation. For the get operation, it's basically almost the same. I have to input my master password, which is again the really good and super strong ISDF. Uh, I get the, I do the get operation. My user is Steph, and Control C H U is the site where I want to log in, and then I run this. There's some data being sent, and there's some data being received. As again, double encoded, stupid Python tree. How oh, I hate you! And this is the password that was stored by the password storage. And if you go up, then it should be quite the same because it's stored. Eh? So just copy past it here. We can compare it. It's it looks like the same. Eh? We can assume that this is kind of the same. So and then. There's of course uh, another operation. Sometimes you want to have or forced to update your password. There's a change operation, uh, and the change operation is doing basically the same. Here you get the new password, but uh, you know sometimes when you update your password, you fail or the server fails, and so you have. Uh, it's it's good to remember your old password. So if you do another get operation. 
then you still get back the old password. So if, but if you know that the password change has succeeded, then instead of a change operation, you do a commit operation, and from this point on, the change password is indeed the change password. Uh, there's no password being returned in this case. And then there's the last uh, operation that you might want to do is the delete operation, and then the password is deleted from the storage. So this is like the command line client that you can use immediately, and you can like copy past all these passwords into your Firefox or Chrome or wherever you want to log in. So this is already super easy. But there's also, as I said, uh, a web extension that uh, I might be able to show you here. Uh, Do I have somewhere? No, shit. Ah, fuck. Oh, yeah, I'm offline. Oh, oh, yeah, thanks. Oh, yeah, so here I have a mock up uh, login form. Thanks. Uh, and uh, this is the Web Sphinx icon, so you want to log in. And it sees automatically that, oh, I have two users for this website, control-c.hu. I have two users, and I can choose any of those users. It asks me for the password. And as you can see, this is not a standard Firefox pop-up. This is indeed the pin entry pop-up from the PGP package. So the web browser never sees my master password. And I don't trust my browser, so no fucking stupid JavaScript is going to steal this from me, my super um, strong password that you will never be able to guess, I hope. Um, and then there's something not working here for some reason. No, I didn't. Then it wouldn't, then, then it wouldn't show it. Um, ah, here. Okay, so here the other user did indeed work. It automatically fills out the password, automatically fills out my, my username, and I can log in. The same is also working for um, change. Here, when I go to the Web Sphinx, I can say Steph. And I have to do the password, unfortunately, twice. But uh, because for the old password, I have to run a get old password. And for the new password, I have to run the whole thing again. But in this case, I could also change my master password. Um, and that's it. And then I have changed my password. So login. Also for create, of course, the same also applies to create. Here, I, I might be able to give a new password, like, I don't know, um, test user. And uh, here, I am generating a new, the new password, uh, autofill, it asks for. And then I created a new user in the password store, and uh, if I click here, this is really the creation of a new user, but it says here, because these are mock forms. There's nothing behind this. It's just for testing the, the thing. In this case, it would be create the user, test user would be created on the server with my password that is stored on, on the Sphinx password store. So this is uh, the demo about the Sphinx protocol. For the OPAC protocol, unfortunately, I have no demo for you. Any other questions? Can you detect whether the master password was entered correctly? Uh, no, you can only detect that the master password has been uh, by logging in correctly. If your login has been rejected, then it's your probably your master password the problem, hopefully. What happens if your master password are, is compromised? When your can master you password is can, compromised? Can change it without changing all the logins? Huh? That is true. That is true. When your master password is compromised, you indeed have to change all your logins. That is the case, indeed. And, 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 
But the master one. password, this is the case with all master passwords. This is the case with, with all password storages that you use. But uh, if you use a password storage, and I would recommend everyone to use a password storage, but uh, not anyone but this one, <laughs> because it has more security benefits than all the other password storages. And uh, on a side note, if you are forced to change your password, you can also just ask the, what, what happens in, in this case is, uh, it's only just generating a new sort on the server, right? You can still use the same master password. And the nice thing about this is, is unlike, for example, with KeePassX, where the whole SQLite database is encrypted with one master password, here you can indeed use different passwords for different security levels if you want, or for different domains or something like, I don't know. So you don't have to use always ASDF. You can also use Quert sometimes and sometimes ZX. VC or something, eh? and then only one of your master passwords gets uh, compromised. So you're not really forced to use always the same master password with Sphinx, unlike with, with, with a database where the whole database is encrypted from a password uh, that is the key is derived by hashing the password or something. right? So you have the, the opportunity to use more passwords than one with this protocol. Should be aware of there is no password recovery, so you, you must make a copy or yes, uh, right. or, or make like really sure that you you you, you will remember. You can no do a backup of the of the salt, but you should store it offline in a very secure area because then. But I mean your master password. Oh yeah, the master password. You, you, you must remember it or. Of course, but yeah, of course. Make sure that you, 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 you remember. Yeah, that is true. But you only have to remember one or a couple of master passwords, like you also have to do with other password storages. So there's, in this regard, there's, there's no difference to other password storages, except for that you can actually use more than one master password, which is a good thing. I think, thank you, Dan. <laughs>